and we're <clears throat> love to have everybody, especially all those that have driven so long to, to come up here. Um, we're going to talk about incubation today, and okay, that's yeah. going to kill them yeah. all. Is that going to do too much? Uh, I can't see what I'm doing, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know I'd kill them all. We've got a panel that <clears throat> after Clyde night to give our presentation. <clears throat> So we'll bring up here, and I hope you brought some questions to ask, and uh, we want to make this very informal but uh, informational, so that you walk away today with uh, some information. Both Clyde and I have uh, done the PowerPoint presentations slide by slide, so that you can go through there and follow us, take notes if you want, and then we've included on the left side, is a list of uh, Galliformes and all the species that I could find that we know incubation for. And I'm really surprised how many that we don't know incubation for. Um, waterfall, I think we know uh, most of them, but uh, particularly in the South American quail um, and in the uh, Asian uh, partridge, very little is known, unless it's been in captivity for a while. And then I've also included a, a couple of handouts, one from the University of Florida on troubleshooting, and then the other one is from uh, MTech, it's a hatch up, uh, hatchability troubleshooting guide that will be included. And then Clyde has his handouts. Plus, he's provided a handout with the um, incubation for all the waterfalls. So, I think this is the first time that both all the upland game birds and the waterfall species together have been put together in, in the form of a handout. So, this is a, a unique opportunity today. I don't. Well, we'll see, because I think that's too high for some of the slides. Well, it's right at the top. Okay. Well, we've entitled it, Gamer Hatching, the Art and Science of Incubation. And there are two things today. One, I think, you know, as we go through this afternoon, you'll understand that there's no one correct way to incubate uh, bird eggs. Um, and that a lot of people do it differently, and I think that's where the art comes in. A lot of people have been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years, and they've learned um, various techniques that have worked for them, and that's why we're bringing up the panel as well. And the other thing is that people have, have honed in on the science and made it in sort of an art form as to how they do things. So um, just take away the, the best information for you and, and develop a strategy that works for yourself. <coughs> the galliforms, basically, are just uh, real briefly, we have five families, 85 gender, over 300 species. So worldwide, it's a, a, a very diverse uh, group of birds, the megapodes, uh, which are the mound builders, uh, the crassids, which are Treptolacus, Guans, and Curasaws, Nimidae, the guinea fowl, um, Dr. Foraday, the New World Quail, and Faziana Day, which is partridge, pheasants, franklins, turkeys, grouse. Some new taxonomists that will separate the grouse and the turkeys um, out a little bit. But they all produce precocial chicks, which means that uh, they hatch with feathers down on them. And in some bird eggs, they actually go through a molt. If you're raising um, uh, Indians and uh, some of the curasaws, um, some of the larger eggs, the actual wing <coughs> feathers, they in the egg will form a downy feather and then at the later stages that pops off and actually the um, true uh, primary feathers will start growing inside the egg. So when they hatch, dragon pans are like this that they've gone through one molt inside the egg already and can fly within uh, just hours of, of hatching. 
Uh, they can partially thermoregulate and they leave the nest after hatching. The biology of birds are what I put into, into this. I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but what I'm trying to do is to get everybody to look at incubation starts way before the eggs are ever laid. And what we need to do is condition our flock, condition our birds into um, the optimal conditions for when that egg is laid. Um, we have to consider the diet in the wild. Um, we have a great diversity of uh, niches, uh, ecological areas that they're found in. Um, when do they come sexually mature? Like firebacks, it takes three years. True pheasants is one out of the waterfall. Uh, the dabbling ducks is one year, but the geese and, and swans can be up to three years. And then we have to figure out their mat <coughs> mating strategies. Social monogamy, <coughs> pair bonds for one or more seasons, like the like the eared pheasants. Polyandry, females accept more than one mate during the season, like the true pheasants. And then uh, polygamy, where males mate with two or more females. It's a left behavior like you have in the grouse, the prairie chickens. And so what we have to kind of understand is, are we providing the right um, habitat, sort of the right enclosure for the birds so that in the natural, in the natural, that reproduces <coughs> occur in the natural state? If not, maybe that's one of the reasons why we're getting in for the legs. The reproductive strategy considerations, <coughs> eggs have evolved with species to hatch under the environment conditions where they're laid in the wild. And so species that are from the upper Himalayas, the egg is much different than eggs like the peacock pheasants that are laid in the tropics. Um, the quail from the very arid southwest United States, those eggs uh, physically are much different than uh, in the wet tropics. So we have to kind of consider where that species originated um, and how that egg uh, evolutionarily wise is laid, how many pores, um, that sort of thing. So what I want you to do is to think about knowing the habitat from where your birds come from, uh, look at uh, are they dry to wet climates, from sea level to high mountain ranges, are they from a latitude standpoint, are they from a temperate region like here in Pennsylvania, or are they a tropical species? Because when they lay, and how those eggs physically um, manifest themselves is much different. And so if you have a, have a big multi-species um, collection, you may treat some eggs differently than you treat others. The health of the eggs. Going back to again, we need to look at the genetics of the parents. Are you providing the best uh, genetic pairs that, uh, that are possibly for you? Um, are they inbred or not? We need to start looking at diets at least six weeks out. Um, and here, I have aliens that start laying in March. So I'm changing into a breeding uh, diet sometime in uh, mid-February. Uh, we want to make sure it's a balanced ration, a little bit higher protein, some source of calcium, vitamins, probiotics, and greens for some species. So what I want you to think about, are you providing all the nutrition that's needed for that particular species? All our commercial diets are based upon true pheasants, the ring neck basically. Um, and so when we have other species from other climates, from other conditions, what they're eating in the wild, <coughs> we may have to supplement those diets uh, accordingly. Eggs from malnourished, inbred parents don't hatch well. I mean, that's a pretty good axiom that, that if you've got inbred uh, parents, um, they're not getting the right nutrition, you really can't expect much out of, out of hatchability for those eggs. The clutch size and behavior. This is interesting because the clutch is the number of eggs laid by one female during a single nest attempt. And that really varies from species to species. We have those that are determinate layers that will not lay any more eggs 
if some are removed, peacock pheasants are very much like that. Indeterminate layers will continue to lay and pull eggs away. I, I like to think of those as the, the uh, species that can't count very well. <laughs> and then temperate species in general lay more eggs per clutch than, than tropical species. And there's a couple reasons for that is that in temperate regions, a lot of times nests will go bad. They have to to uh, relay. In tropical settings, the eggs actually start incubating almost as soon as they're laid, so they, they have a very small clutch. Um, and it's very species specific. So what you need to do is going into a season, as you're trying to determine what to do with the eggs, is to know the history about the species you're you're keeping. To leave or not to leave, um, when you get an egg, that's the um, premise that we have to look at. Um, we have to look at the behavior of the pair. We may have four different pair of goldens, but they act differently. Um, do you have nest boxes in good cover, or is that species a dumped layer? I have one pair of blue ear that she waits for a rainstorm and lays in the bottom of a puddle. And, and she'll dump the eggs. I've got nest boxes high and low and good cover and everything else, but it's a game we play. Um, and uh, I'll show you a couple eggs later, but she loves laying in mud. And then we have to look at the daily temperature. Early on in the season, we've got to be concerned about those eggs freezing. Late in the season, are we getting too high in temperature so that uh, uh, we may start incubation by leaving it in the pen for a day or two, um, excessive heat, and the amount of rain or snow that you're getting at the time. So there's no one set rule for leaving an egg or not. Um, and the use of dummy eggs, the first egg laid. A lot of times the first egg I'll leave um, in the nest if she's laid it in a nest, uh, hoping because that um, they're bonding with that nest and the second egg will take it and put a dummy egg in, that sort of thing. And again, you have to know the pairs that you're working with, how, how um, well they tolerate the manipulation of the, of the eggs. And sometimes you have a picky female and she knows her own eggs. If you put an egg that's a dummy from somebody else, she rejects it, you'll find it rolled out of the nest. And so you have to get to know individual pairs. Egg handling, I can't stress enough to wash your hands and keep um, hands uh, clean when handling eggs. We have oils on our hands that uh, can get into the pores of eggs and cause problems. Minimize the handling. And there's going to be a great debate, and, and I'll mention this now, but we can talk about it more during the forum part, whether you use a disinfectant or not. I disinfect all eggs. Um, over the years, I've just found that I, I get a better hatch if I do than if I don't. Um, the water, a couple things, water must be higher than the egg, or because if you're using cold water with an egg, it's going to force that water in through the pores, into the membrane inside, and it'll bring with it any bacteria that's on the surface of the egg. Uh, minimize the time and solution. I'll make up a solution in just a small little um, pan, and I'll, I'll wash the eggs, but I'll keep, keep them in there for a few seconds to, you know, just the shortest amount of time that I can. And use a pre prescribed egg disinfectant. There are a lot on the market nowadays. I use one that uh, uh, Stromberg's has. Um, I think it's the same formula that Cool uh, Egg Company used to have. The Russell. The one in yellow there, I don't think is um, any longer available. This slide is actually from, uh, I think, the Minnesota Zoo back in the 70s. So uh, I tried to look them up and couldn't find them. You notice the eggs on the upper right here. These four are blue-eared eggs. That's the female that loves to lay in a, in a mud puddle. I was able to wash and disinfect those eggs and I did get one of those to hatch. So it's not always a lost cause if, if you're having eggs that are in poor shape. 
if you're not using disinfectant, there are some advantages. The cuticle layer is a natural protection on eggs. Um, your original gland, which is the little gland at the base of the rump at the tail, um, has some antibacterial oil, and that's one of the reasons why when you leave eggs in a nest under natural conditions, the uh, hen that laid the egg, or if you're taking it to a surrogate with a bantam, um, they seem to hatch better. And, and there's been some work done that, that uh, your original gland has some antibacterial oil in it. And if you have a soiled egg and, and don't want to uh, wash it, use a little sandpaper. Um, try, try not to get beyond the cuticle layer because that uh, will cause some differences as well. Egg storage, which we want to make sure is that we have a stable room where we store the eggs. Um, temperature and humidity control if, is the best possible thing. Uh, avoid temperature swings. I know people that hatch and store their eggs out in a garage and in the spring of the year, sometimes we'll get a 30 degree temperature up and down, and that's really not very conducive for hatchability on eggs. So um, you can use sand, or I use egg cartons. Uh, just make sure they're clean egg cartons and uh, not soiled from previous use. Turn daily. I like to turn at least a couple times a day. And one thing I found is instead of trying to turn individual eggs, if you prop one end up and then uh, take your whole tray and then turn it, that'll help. You don't have to handle individual eggs. And I like to set, um, so I store the eggs no more than seven days. There's nothing magical about seven, but the longer that you store the eggs, um, the hatchability is going to go down. And we're if you're working with tropical species, with galliforms, um, that even becomes shorter in that uh, like peacock pheasants lay an egg clutch of two and they don't store very well at all. So you, again, going back to the species that you're working with. Ron, I have a question while you're talking about egg storage and temperature. Has, have you ever read anything in the literature about warming a stored egg up at least once during the day while it's in storage? as when a hen returns to the nest to sit and lay her next egg. All those eggs are warmed up to her body temperature when she leaves, they drop back down again. Has there been any... Uh, I don't know that there's that? been any scientific studies, that, you know, peer-reviewed uh, um, blind, re you know, blind uh, study, but certainly there's been some anecdotal information about that. Um, I think, again, that's where the art comes into this. Right. That in some cases, what you're trying to do is to do, um, um, look at what a hen may be doing under a net in, a, in true conditions, and so that's not unreasonable to to do that. Um, I just don't like the real extremes that yeah, way. Not the constant waxing right. and raining. I I storm at at a fairly constant temperature in the basement. Um, my basement doesn't have a big fluctuation in, in uh, temperature. I do have to put a dehumidifier in there in the later part of the season because uh, uh, we get too much moisture in the basement. But yeah, that's a good question though. Yeah, and, and I do the same in my basement. I have a closet there that stays at 55 degrees pretty much all spring. But conversely, looking at the incubation period, I noticed when I let my eggs cool down for about an hour each day during the incubation period, that I get a much higher percentage of Patrick by letting them cool. I just didn't know if you heard of anything about that even more about while they were in storage. Yeah. No, I've certainly heard people that do that, but I'm not aware of any, you know, science studies that most of the work that we use for game bird incubation is based upon the chicken egg. I mean, there are literally volumes and volumes that are feet high on what the poultry industry has done. But what's happened with the poultry industry, they've actually changed the genetic of the birds to fit the hatchability in the hatches that they have. And so I'm going to get into that a little bit here, but, but there's a difference between wild species and domestic poultry. So I, I think what you have to do is determine what your best method is. And it goes back to how much time you have. 
if you're working a full-time job and and uh, uh, can't do all of this, then do the best that you can. And, and I think that's a key element. Natural incubation, you may, if you're going to go that route with a hand that you think is going to sit, make sure your enclosure is secure. Um, predators can't get in. And in mine, I, I've actually had trouble in between pens um, where I've had an Elliot and a uh, copper side by side and and they're pacing and digging and and the adults can't go back and forth but when chicks hatch all of a sudden I, I find them up underneath and I find the Elliot chicks in with the coppers and that really doesn't go well. Uh, a protected nest site, is she secure in the area where she's nesting? Um, when you're feeding uh, and watering every day, um, is it an area where she doesn't have to get off the nest when you're doing that. <laughs> and the parent or a surrogate, again, whether uh, the female is stable enough to, to handle the incubation. And <clears throat> with surrogates, you have to have a number of hens on standby. There, there are people here in this room that hatch with bannies that are, are much more uh, knowledgeable about that, and we'll bring that up during the forum. Uh, the timing and clutch size, again, it, it goes back to the amount of time that you have and how much energy that you can put into this. And match the size of the egg to the surrogate. If you're trying to um, hatch partridge or quail eggs, you're not looking for a full-size uh, coaching, uh, and so that sort of thing. So you have to match the, the size of your hand to the size of the egg. Artificial incubation, I think what the best thing I can tell you here today is location, location, location. Make sure that you have a room that as much as possible is temperature and humidity controlled. Avoid temperature swings. It's secure that you have a, a constant power source as best as we can. Um, and you have a backup power source if you if you're really um, doing this into a, a large hobby or full-time business, then you need to have some backup. Otherwise, you could lose an entire year's worth of work um, if power goes out. There are different types of incubators. The, uh, those on top are old humidair. Um, bottom picture is uh, my setup. And there are still air incubators. And what you're doing is you're on an average temperature for the whole incubation period. Um, and then I like to use separate hatchers. And the other thing is to consider cost of how much can you afford to put into all this fancy equipment. And so maybe bantams and surrogates are a better option for you just because you can't afford nice brand new incubators. Setting eggs. I set on a specific day, I set on a Monday, but maybe with, if you're working, um, a weekend is better for you. And if I set on a Monday, I know because of the very collection I have that there's going to be hatching on several different days. The other method to do is to set several times a week according to the length of incubation of that species so then they all hatch at the same time, so you're moving all the birds into the hatcher at the same time, your hatcher is consistent. I've never done that. I've never, it, it seems like it takes more thought process for me to do that than if I set on a single day and I can figure out, um, you know, goldens are 22 days, coppers are 25, fishies are 28, and then I can figure out what the hatch date should be. I record those dates in the log, and my next slide I'll show you a couple pictures of that. By species, I, I number <coughs> my pens so that I know which pen that egg came out of. Um, that's important because I keep several pairs of, of individual species, and I want to keep track of the genetics on the farm. The date set and when to transfer, and the hatching date all gets recorded. On the egg itself, I record the species, the egg number. I record by um, 
if I'm having Elliot's, I'll do Elliot one egg, two, three, no matter how many different pairs of Elliot's I have. And so it's a chronological number, and I can go back to my record book and see that A25 belonged to pair seven, that sort of thing. But at least have some methodology that you can keep track of things. Um, and I, you can either record on a paper calendar, or I use, and I'll show you on my next slide, I use the calendar on a cell phone. And that works out pretty well. <coughs> I know it's, it's difficult to see, but you have this slide in your handout. This is actually part of my log sheet. This is the species, blue-eared, white-eared, Kojima copper, uh, black Franklin, lineated, um, and then it's the egg number, egg number one, number seven. Um, information about afterwards, if it's hatched, infertile, and I weigh and measure each one of my eggs, and I know a lot of people don't have time to do that, but it's something I've done for, oh, about 40 years. So this is the weight of the egg in grams, um, and in millimeters, the, it's 60.3 millimeters by 40.9, and that allows me to um, manipulate the eggs by egg, egg weight loss, but it gives me a base information, and I understand that people are really busy and they, they can't do all that recording, but it's something that, that I've done that's helped. This is a, a screenshot of my cell phone, and what I do is I mark down the day that those eggs should be moved and the day they should be hatched. So on uh, June 15th of this year, I moved Ijima Copper eggs 40 to 45. Saw Marine, 22-33, lineated 45-48, and LA number 41-42. Now this one is the day, this is a different date, but the day they were asked, again, species and egg number, so that I can keep track of when to move eggs from the incubators to the hatcher and keep track of things. But I found that the you know, the little calendars in the cell phones work really well for that. It's a little tedious on hatch or on setting day to go in there and, and record all those, but after you get, get into a system, it's there and you can actually set reminders so that you know the day before that you're going to have to move eggs for these species. You know that uh, on a certain day, you get a reminder of the day before that you're supposed to, these are supposed to hatch. And so you can really try to keep keep track of a lot of different eggs, different species, um, pretty well in, in the cell phone. Again, very dark. This is um, going back to in the 70s. This is uh, from Minnesota Zoo. Um, we had a lot of keeper staff, and we were at Cindy can tell you. Uh, but this is a species, um, the number of the father and the mother, the day lay day incubating, due date, all that sort of thing is kept. <coughs> I was back to Minnesota Zoo this, this past summer. I haven't been there in, in decades. And I went back and I could find out eggs that I had set during the 70s and figure out what was going on. And so that information moving forward, because if we're looking for conservation purposes on, on eggs and on species, this is the kind of information that will help understand where we're at, where we want to be, and where we're going. Incubator, hatcher sanitation. I put up the three things, and sometimes we get these confused. The difference between sanitize, disinfect, and sterilize. Sanitize is to clean and, and reduce potentially harmful microorganisms. The disinfect is the cleanest to destroy those micro microorganisms. And sterilize is, you know, it's, it's to clean the slate and nothing living afterwards. So, and we want to make sure that the beginning of the season we've cleaned and then sterilized our incubators, our hatchers. Um, 
use recommended dilutions. In the next slide, I'll show you some different types of products and use proper protection and equipment because some of these things are very caustic and can be very harmful to yourself. <coughs> Again, refer to the handouts because it's difficult to see. And this was taken from an uh, egg incubation workshop that was done at the Toledo Zoo um, back in 2018. They spent a whole week on incubation. We've got a couple hours here today, but they spent a whole week on the um, workshop. But um, category, the type of agent is up on top, what the active ingredients is, um, examples of the products, the properties, and where best to use it. So this is really a pretty good um, chart as to help you find products that you want to use and that sort of thing. Again, an incubator hatching room, well ventilated, temperature, I say 65 to 75, you want to keep the humidity low because you can you can increase humidity in an incubator, but you can never decrease it lower than what the room is, lower than the air that's being sucked into it. And that's an important concept to remember. Temperatures um, most Incubators are set at 99.5 to, to 75 in forced air, still air. I mentioned earlier, a little bit warmer. And that's because we're taking an average and it takes longer for still air to, to come up to temperature and come up, and particularly in humidity. Um, check the settings often. Um, make sure you got good ventilation, um, that you have backup parts if you're using, particularly if you're using <coughs> Uh, the wafer systems, make sure you have those on hand and the little micro switches um, because if you have to order it after it goes bad, you're going to lose an entire setting in the incubator. Automatic or hand turning. I use, uh, if possible, automatic turners and set them for an hour uh, on the hour. Um, when I used it to hand turn, I would try to do it three times a day. Humidity levels. I use three different settings. I have, I have enough incubators that I can set at a low humidity, almost as low as I can get it in the room, kind of a medium humidity, 35 to 45%, and a high 50 to 60%. I use distilled water if possible. Um, wet bulb, dry bulb comparison and relative humidity. In my next slide, I want to go into that a little bit more, and again, um, you can't get humidity in the incubator lower than what it is in the room. And that's why we have a lot of trouble later in the season um, here in Pennsylvania in the Midwest is our humidity basically goes up during later spring and we're trying to make those incubators work um, and they should be at a lower humidity but because the air surrounding it is high, um, it just can't do that. I have to refer to the charts again, but this is a relative humidity chart with the dry bulb on one side, the wet bulb on the other, and the relative humidity in the center of the numbers. What you have to remember is that the, the higher the temperature of the air, the more moisture it can hold. And so as temperature rises, um, the relative humidity is going to change. And most of the literature that we talk about is not is in relative humidity, not wet bulb. And a lot of people make that mistake when they're first starting out is they're looking at their, their wet bulb rating. You know, it's the thermometer with the wick and um, it's wet. And they're looking at that and, look, and thinking that's relative humidity. But that's your wet bulb rating, not relative to humidity. So, it's an important concept to remember to keep separate. And hatchers uh, increase the humidity. I raise it up to at least 65%. Um, and if possible, I separate genetic lines with little, I use little boxes. I know James Farr uses onion bags. He puts those eggs in an onion bag, ties it with a twist tie, and, 
and hatches different strains of birds that he's raising. Um, there are all types of different uh, tex techniques. The important part is if you're trying to maintain genetic diversity, it starts with the egg and when the chick hatches that you have to be able to, to go back and know that it's separate at that point. Um, I stopped turning three days before the hatch date. That's when I moved from the hatchers, or from the incubators over to the hatchers. And I keep a little spray bottle of distilled water in my hatcher. And every time I open it to check on something, I, I do a quick spritz, and that helps bring that humidity back up very quickly. And if I'm working on an egg that's not hatching, I'll spray it to keep that membrane moist. Um, you keep in mind that this period of time, those three days, the chick is transitioning from um, basically membrane breeding to air lung breeding. And so that's when the egg is probably one of the most vulnerable parts, is that we get anxious, we see the pip and there doesn't seem to be any movement, and we want to we want to help. So we go in there and we pull the shell off a little bit, and you look into it, and you're fiddling around with the tweezers on the membrane. All of a sudden, you cut that membrane, and she's bleeding out. And so what happens um, biologically is that that process, when the egg pips from, and it's called an internal pip, when you go from um, the chick is up under the right uh, wing, and it's pipping into that membrane, the egg tooth is cutting the membrane, and sticks its bill up into the air cell, is it's taking its first lung breathing, it's taking its first breath. That triggers Phyllis opera triggers so that um, the membrane breathing starts decreasing as the CO2 is built up in the egg and more oxygen breathing through the air cell. And that takes a couple days. And so if you go in there and start manipulating things um, too soon, it can have really difficult uh, problems. I talk about there's a physical egg and a biological egg. This is something I developed back in the 70s at Minnesota Zoo. The biological is the developing embryo that we think of the egg developing. The physical egg is what I like to consider the physical structures. It's the egg uh, shell, the membranes, and those are surrounding the biological or developing embryo, the developing egg. Both respond to environmental conditions surrounding the egg, the temperature, the humidity, the air pressure. So that egg is responding to the environmental conditions surrounding it if it's in an incubator or if it's under a hen. And so, two parts, physical and biological. Let me go to the next slide. Here's a, a really detailed picture of an egg showing you all the different parts. The egg shell, the membranes of various types, enveloping um, egg yolk, um, and the Blastoderm is starting to develop. Um, so there are physical parts to the egg, and then there's the growing embryo, the biological part. If we take a, a cross section of the egg to look at the pores, and this is really important, is that the water vapor surrounding the egg, the membranes, it's a, through osmosis, it's a one way membrane. The water in the egg is being forced out because the air pressure on the outside of the egg is less than on the inside. So the water goes out through the membrane, through the pores. And so that's how you get the air cell. As the egg is starting to lose weight, the air surrounding the egg has less pressure than the inside. And that water vapor is moving through the membrane and out through those pores. What's important to understand is when, if we go back to the, when I talked about these species, whether it came from a very arid, dry Himalayas or the southwestern United States, or whether that's a species in Borneo um, 
and at Peacock Festival is the number of cores per unit area is different in each one of those species. And so, again, if we are manipulating the eggs and our hands are greasy and we've clogged up some of those pores with the oil from our hand, then that water can't get out through those vessels and it can't lose enough weight. Again, if we sandpaper that egg to get some of that soil off, and we've cut through some of those membranes, the water can move out faster and it may lose more weight than what's supposed to be. And so I mentioned this just to give you an idea that um, this is what's happening physically and biologically with the egg, is that there are two different processes going on at the same time. Egg weight loss, and I've, I've provided the club with a, um, a couple times with uh, an article that I wrote, but it's a management tool that was developed in 1970 when I was at the Minnesota Zoo. And it's based on data from both wild species and domestic. We had people looking in the wild, and they were just uh, weighing the eggs as they eggs um, through the incubation process. <coughs> What we find out is that domestic poultry lose about 11%. We're talking mostly the commercial chicken eggs. Um, wild species lose about 15 to 16%. And I developed a process where we can manage those eggs during incubation. It used to be that in the poultry industry, you would say I had 87% hatch or 93% hatch. And so at the end, they would calculate, well, to get a better hatch, I would have to do this or that to the incubator. This process allows you, and it was developed because at zoos, sometimes we're dealing with species that you get one egg a year that you're working with. And so you don't want to wait till next year to, to try to get that egg to hatch better. And so you can manipulate that egg by placing that egg in different either temperatures mostly in humidity conditions to lose even more weight or stay the same. You like my little graphics? <laughs> in the egg weight process, again, the moisture in the egg is going through the membranes and it's going out um, through that membrane, through the pores, and what's coming back is, is air. Um, water out, air in, and that's why you get this increase in um, air cell during the incubation period. And there's a gas balance between the amount of CO2 as the chick is respirating and the amount of air, and so they, that is try to, the egg tries to stay um, in balance between the two. Graphene eggs, I won't take up much time because I've, I've gone over this in the past. Um, these charts are the weight of, in grams of an egg um, over incubation period. And I take the initial weight, subtract 15% at the end of incubation, and then I weigh the eggs on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And so then I graph the eggs and this will tell me anything above the line as I'm graphing it, the egg is in two wet conditions. Anything below the line is in two dry conditions. And that's why I keep three incubators of uh, three different humidity conditions. Because I'll move eggs during incubation to fit the parameters that that egg is showing me. And yeah, it's a lot of work, but I do this particularly in some very rare species to try to get a better, better hatch. I won't go into this, but basically um, you can read it, and if you have any questions, you can get, get in touch with me. Handling eggs is important. Um, matter of fact, I used to have some very expensive lion handlers and um, very sophisticated things. I found out this is an LED 
flashlight. It's about 750 lumen. And when I go to candle anything, um, I can get through even the, the uh, darkest egg possible and I can see into that egg. So I think this cost 15 bucks or something. So it was a very good tool. The other tool that I ran across this year is by Elatech and it's a digital um, data recorder. And I can take this, put it in the incubator and it records temperature and humidity. Um, and what I can do then is take that out, put it in my laptop, and it'll show me graphically for how many hours I had it in the incubator, what the temperature and humidity is. And I can compare that to the settings on my incubator to see if that's um, where it's supposed to be set. This one cost under $30, and I, Sam, you're using this, right? I, I haven't used them yet, but I got them. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's an invaluable tool. The other thing is there are a lot of charts and diagrams on, on uh, a uh, handling, and I won't go into it because we've got a lot of other information I want to give uh, uh, everybody else a chance. But uh, I've included a couple of different troubleshooting charts in your information as well. It's very important for candle eggs to know what's going on, whether it's in a true infertile, whether it's an early dead, late dead, middle dead, and so that you can understand what's going right and if there are corrections in your incubation um, process that need to be changed. The hatching process, I went over this a little bit. Um, the embryo is at its largest state. The membrane breathing is difficult. That's when it kind of triggers it to dip into the air cell. And the embryo consumes fluid. Chicks actually drink excess fluid uh, before they hatch. And sometimes, if you've seen sticky chicks where there's this really sticky um, gelatinous material, that's actually fluid that has been drunk by the chick and passed through the system and comes out as this really sticky, gelatinous um, membrane. Uh, fluid, semi-fluid, and it, it, it one, it, it's tough on the kidneys, and two, um, it uh, actually can prevent the chick from turning inside the egg to do a proper um, pip around, around the egg. Um, I won't go through all the rest of these, but it's just, these are stages that the, the chick goes through during the, during the hatching process, which takes Normally, uh, two to three days, depending upon on the species. We've all been there where we, we, it's tough to wait. You think the egg is not hatching and we want to assist it, and I've done it myself. I, I continue to, to slap my hand sometimes that uh, I want to go in and, and, and help it out. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. If you want to monitor that process, is it an abnormal or air cell, is the chick pipped wrong at the other end, are the membranes too dry, is there a lack of progress, is the chick seem lethargic, um, did it pip into the air cell and then no progress whatsoever, do you want to keep the humidity high, are the veins still active, and this is where I said where if you, if you scratch or pip or, or cut through that membrane and it's still breathing through the membrane, the egg is uh, still um, getting um, blood through the veins and they haven't shut down yet. As the chick breathes air, that process shuts down and those veins uh, close off and they finally stop and it's all air breathing. But during that process, if you, if you cut it, you can actually have a chick bleed to death uh, on you. And these are sort of the things that I look at before I, I go in and, and uh, um, try to help. And, but at some point, if it's a day after all the other chicks of that species, of that setting have hatched, nothing's going on, you're better off to go in there, peel it out, and hope for the best. And sometimes that works, and I've been very successful doing that. But, but I just put it in there and use caution and know the steps of what's going on with the chick. 
banding. Important to keep genetic strains separate um, or to keep similar species um, separate. Uh, I use electrical ties. I band the chicks as they're coming out of the incubator and I keep little wooden uh, trays inside the hatcher so I can keep things separate. Each baby trouble chart, I'm not going to go through that with you. I presented one and there's a, there's a couple other handouts from universities have others. No incubation, uh, troubleshooting chart uh, showing the stages of eggs and uh, this one is where they die and what sort of process to look at. You can actually drive yourself insane by, by trying to look at these and figure out exactly every egg, um, what's going on, and you know, because it'll, each one of these charts will give you a range of three or four things to look at. And all of a sudden, your, your brain is full of all these ideas, it's sort of like being on social media, and, and all of a sudden, you just get overloaded. But what you have to do is to look at what's going on, and is there a pattern that's developing, is there something I need to change in the system that I'm developing? And if it works, then continue to, to do what works for you. References, uh, a couple of different, uh, the new incubation book and a guide to better hatching are both uh, paperbacks and very inexpensive, but they're very good books and some, some of the references that I've used as handouts as well.